So I'm gonna be talking about teaching and learning dignity. I've written this for you and, so, and I need to read it to you. First, preliminary thoughts. We live in a dangerous world, a world given to war, a world that lives off inequality. To talk of learning dignity is to envision learning our way out of being such a world. That world is layered, sustained by ways of thinking, habits of relating and taking action and their habitual neurochemistries. Learning dignity means transformation on all those levels. While learning means an encounter with the world as it is, it also means an encounter with how this world, given to war and given to inequality, is embedded within us. Deep learning changes us. There are some questions to answer before teaching in the interest of being realistic. Who can you teach? Who can you reach? Who wants to learn? How do you weaken the understandings and habits of this world and spread the practice of mutuality, the practice of common dignity, so they become the world? We change not alone, but together. In the face of a world reluctant to believe life can be otherwise, teaching dignity is part of the resistance to believing that what is, is all that can be. Our mantra is, life holds more. Concept of university. Universities are institutions that can free us, but they can also embody the mindset of a world given to war, a world that lives off inequality. We are reconceiving university today as the universe of humans needing to face up to an historical task common to all of us, learning how to be something other than a world given to war, other than a world of inequality. Scholars may have made that journey, but they may not have. Anyone on the planet may have or may not have. All of us are growing out of the world we've steeped in, inventing something better that we have little experience with. We set out together to learn our way into something we're not already familiar with. We can talk about a new worldview and that's important. New thoughts and worldviews open possibilities. With them, we can tease out assumptions that sustain war or inequality, that block concern for real people in their real lives, that block our thinking and imagining new possibilities. But though a worldview changes, actual living and relating may not. Educationally, our aspiration is to make the learning experience an experience of living in a changed way. That means engaging in a practice, something done here that can be done every day in real living. Practices like mutuality, collaboration, valuing and appreciating what is being discovered together. So content and teaching methods are not separate if what goes on during learning embodies the concepts and the practice being taught. Dignity here. There are many ways to teach, each creating dignity in its own way. Whatever the way, everyone in the room is meant to experience their own dignity in what happens here. How is that achieved? As we teach, we're discovering the answer to that question along with everyone else in the room. We are co-learners, co-teachers, imagining together, thinking together, feeling our way together into something that is hard to find in the world as it is. We aspire to use methods where people experience the world of inequality is not happening here. The world of potential violence is not happening here. Here, each person's thinking, imagining, and feeling makes a contribution. In this place, a world of co-dignity exists for a few hours at least. That comes to be thanks to practices like listening into voice, listening people into thinking, their own thoughts, listening them into their own presence, gratitude for what others in the room bring that would not otherwise happen confrontations within ourselves. 
Our troubled and troubling world continues on because of a layer of automatic responses that are part of the cultures we live in. If those cultures shut down, learning real life can be different and better. If they shut down equal dignity, cultures like competitive academia, economic culture, political culture, and for many of us, poignantly, even the manners of communicating in our own home cultures. In learning, we're confronted with the ways our institutions and home cultures embody inequality and the right to be violent, but also with how this may live on within us without our even being aware of it. We have, after all, had to adapt to life in such worlds. We've had to make our life in their midst. That's what we've had to work with. Deep learning is resistance on its way to growth. The partially tuned out life. In the work and culture of systems like governments, businesses, uh, when they are the world given to inequality and war, we're called on to dissociate from conscience and concern from vulnerability and to think in terms of the tasks those institutions care about. We become less able to see real people and their real lives, including our own. In an undissociated life, we realize human beings go through life and life has an impact on their spirit, on their heart, their presence, their voice, and on ours too character, how we've adapted to those impacts speaks to the inner nature of our journey through life's good and bad. Character becomes who we are and who others are. It's helpful to recognize others and ourselves in that way. But that's not what a world of inequality and war wants us to attend to. That world asks us to live a tuned out life so we don't see a world with consciences and vulnerabilities and hopes and loves. We see a world of tasks, career paths, thoughts and reactions that are expectable, automatic. Learning our way into becoming a different kind of world requires becoming undissociated from identifying with those institutions and identify more with our humanness. That kind of learning takes us out of our automatic responses into a deeper feel for others and ourselves. We reorient around real lives where we can do real things that alter the historical moment for real people, more attuned to conscience and concern. What's right here that breaks down hierarchy? People suffer in a world given to war, a world built on inequality. Such worlds cannot sustain themselves if empathy breaks out. Real people, real lives begin to matter more than the rules of inequality. Opening to the suffering of others expands our openness to the suffering within our own lives in response to the world we've had to adapt to, as well as the lives of others. We can become more present, more realistic, more effective. When a feel for suffering breaks out, inequality begins to break down. Hierarchy hooks us into its dramas by triggering our neurobiologies, that instant arousal of anger, humiliation, fear, collapse. We can defend ourselves against those reactions by using practices such as Thich Nhat Hanh has advocated and many others, breathing meditation, practices that shift the baseline of our feel for life into inner serenity, being at peace with life. And as the Dalai Lama and Archbishop Tutu advocated, joy, so they can become more solid no matter what the world is trying to evoke in us emotionally or does evoke in us emotionally. Hierarchical living is not tuned into suffering, but it is also not tuned into warm-hearted connections, love, and joy. Hierarchy cannot sustain itself if people center their lives on those feelings. Learning our way out of tuned out worlds involves opening to the good in life, who and what others love, their hopeful labors, the contributions they mean to make, 
their effectiveness, their joy, and our loves, our joys, the good we mean to do. Learning that transform makes joy one of its practices. So that kind of learning requires making joy one of its practices, not excitement, but joy, warm-hearted and generous. A feel for love and joy in others broadens our ability to feel it in our own lives. And feeling joy and goodness in our own lives, we're more open to gladness for others in theirs. Together, we broaden uh, what we're capable of loving in life so that life does indeed hold more together. What then do we do differently? for and with real people. We have to discover the actual real things to say and do, the practices that really touch others so connection begins or deepens. This can be hard to figure out alone. Learning and teaching can also grow through meeting together again and again among ourselves, growing in trust with each other, growing in entrusting each other with our genuine thoughts and our mistakes, growing in shared understanding of learning and transformation and of real life. A reliable place for such practices can come to feel like home for real presence and the experience of dignity. Here it is, we listen to each other so each finds more of her or his own experience, his or her own understandings and language, their own practice. What has worked and what has not is thought about. Notes are compared. Laughter over foibles is shared. Sadness over the pains of life, those that should not be and those that just are. Together, we talk about what can be done differently and how. Teacher or learner groups can organize and meet monthly on Zoom and get better and better together over months or years. This then is our big aspiration, that we teach and learn our way into being more present, more realistic, more effective, because we think about these matters together. We come to do differently in real life and for real people. The world given to war, the world sustaining itself on inequality, becomes weaker. The world of mutual concern and dignity becomes more present and effective. A bit of the world learns life really does hold more. Historical life becomes better. When we, when you undertake teaching or learning dignity, this is the aspiration we all have in common. Thank you. <laughs>